was encouraging. How are you? I heard about 18 of you. I said, how are you? Awesome. It's a lot of rocks up here. Um, <laughs> my name is uh, Jackie, and I'm going to get straight into the text. Is that okay? All right. I want to pray for us. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for this moment. We thank you for your son. We thank you for your spirit. We pray that you would be among us and you are if Christians are here. We pray that you would open up our understanding, that you would illuminate our hearts, that we would see Jesus. I pray for everyone in the room whose heart is hard towards you, that you would soften it. I pray for those in the room who are scoffers, who are doubtful, who, who are borderline blasphemous. I pray, God, that you would help them to see that you are good and you are true and you are right. God, I pray that we would have a spirit of humility and meekness to receive the implanted word. And I pray that from this day on, that this would just not be a mountain experience, but it will be a life lived. That the women and the girls and the teens in this room would bear much fruit. We pray your blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. First Peter chapter 2, verse 9 says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies, meaning he's excellent, of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. The day God called me out of darkness and into his marvelous light, I wasn't expecting it. I wasn't welcoming it. I did not invite God into my world. I was 19, and up until that point, I acknowledged God. I went to church occasionally, read the Bible sometimes. It made no sense, so I didn't keep going. I had no interest in being a Christian because to me, Christianity seemed uninteresting, seemed joyless, seemed boring. The Christians that I knew wore dresses to their ankles. I didn't want to be a part of that. <laughs> it seemed to me that Christianity was, was, was an ideal that I just couldn't see myself with. Because to me, sinning was fun. Sinning was enjoyable. I, I enjoyed smoking weed. My lips was black and everything. Some of y'all can't relate. I enjoyed getting drunk. I enjoyed being a lesbian. I enjoyed watching pornography. I enjoyed the power even of being able to resist and be disrespectful to authority figures. Sin was enjoyable for me. So that day in 2008, when I was in my room minding my absolute business, and I heard God speak to my heart and say that my lifestyle would be the death of me, I was confused. Because I knew that sin was bad. I didn't know it was deadly. I, I didn't know that things that I enjoyed were actually things that God hated. Had no idea about that. So I sat up in my bed confused by what seemed to be God talking to me. And I knew in that moment that I had a choice to make. That it would either be God, the creator of the universe, the Alpha and Omega, the one who is and who is to come, the, the, the good God, the Savior, the Lord and King, it would either be him or sin. I told God, I said, Lord, I really don't have enough strength to do what you're calling me to do. But I do remember what they said about you in church. I do remember John 3, 16. I, I might not remember nothing else, but I do remember that God so loved the world that whoever believed in him would not perish, but have eternal life. So all I know I can do is believe. 
And through that point, and from that point, I said, God, I trust that you'll help me. The next day I went to work. I worked at Wendy's. I could teach you how to make a junior bacon if you wanted me to. <laughs> Not a Frosty, because that comes in the bag. But uh, I was dressed the same. I sounded the same. I looked the same, but I wasn't the same. And, and I knew I wasn't the same when an opportunity came. I worked the cash register sometimes. An opportunity came where I could, spit, I could steal $20 from the register and not get caught because I used to steal $20 all the time to buy some weed. Yeah, anyway. Um, opportunity came for me to steal, and there was this tension inside of me that I didn't have before. Where, where I wanted to steal because it's just like, it's just, 20, it's just $20, right? And what happened was is that in that moment, I considered God. And I knew that he could see me. And it wasn't like I didn't think God could see me before. I, I grew up in church kind of. So I knew that God could see everything. It was just that for the first time in my life, I cared about what he saw. For the first time in my life, I wanted God to be pleased with the invisible parts of me. That is when I knew I was a Christian. That day at Wendy's happened when I was 19. I'm 33 now with a husband who I've been married to for almost nine years with four children and a dog. <laughs> and praise God. Since that point, every single day I have had experience like the one at the register, where I have had an opportunity to do what I shouldn't do. And I have learned in these small amount of years that I've been in the faith what it looks like to become like Jesus. So tonight, we are going to talk about sanctification. Everybody say sanctification. sanctification. But before we talk about sanctification, we got to talk about salvation. Before we talk about salvation, we have to talk about sin. As Jamie taught us last night in Genesis 3 is when we see the entry of sin into the world. God tells Adam that he cannot, cannot eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the day that he eats of it, he will surely die. That's a command. Eve, his wife, is in the garden. And Satan comes in the body of a snake and asks Eve a question. That's usually where all of your temptation starts is, is with the question. He says, did God really say that you should not eat from the tree? And the Bible says that she looks at the tree and she says, oh, wow, that looks good for food. Oh, my. That's desire to make one wise. I, I'm sure she didn't sound like a white girl, but you know. <laughs> it just seemed to fit the, the text. <laughs> Oh, wow. <laughs> That's a delight to the eyes, right? Like, <laughs> have you ever thought about how Eve sees good things in the thing God said would kill her? The problem is, it didn't matter how good the tree looked. What mattered is what God said about it. So let's get practical. We are in a culture that will make you believe that you have the right to decide what goodness is. That if it's fun, it must be good. If it's pleasurable, it must be good. If it, if it doesn't harm anybody, it must be good. What if it harms God? We never ask that question. What, what if it grieves God's spirit? And the problem is that the only person in heaven and on earth who has the right, the authority to decide what is good and what isn't good is God. Why? Because he's God. Also because he's good. Eve did not consider God's character or God's word when she looked at the tree. So then she trusted herself. She trusted her wisdom. She trusted her own perceptions of what is good and what isn't good. And she made a decision in light of that. And Adam too. With Adam ate from the fruit of the tree, he sinned against God because he disobeyed God's command. And what's crazy is, is that when they ate the fruit of the tree, I bet it tasted good. But even
even though it tasted good, it still killed him. You cannot determine what is right or what is righteous or what is lawful or what is good or what is holy based on how it makes you feel. You must determine goodness by what God has said about it. This is a major key because knowing this will make a big difference if, about if you become a wise woman or not. If you want to be a wise woman, you have to cultivate and develop the discipline of making decisions based on God's word regardless of how you feel. When you do that, you will be shocked at how much you grow. Since Adam and Eve are our first parents, since we are born after them, we are therefore born with Adam's sin. So when you were born into the world, cute, bald, whatever you were, <laughs> you were born with a sin problem. You were born in darkness, you didn't discover darkness, you, you've been in it. So, so it doesn't matter if your parents are Christian. It, it doesn't matter if your parents are pastors. Sounds aggressive, but you need to know. It does not matter if you were raised in church. You, you were not born Christian. You were not even born a child of God. You must be made one. You were born in sin and shaped in iniquity, and it is only by grace through faith that you could be born again. Now, when I say that you were born in darkness, what does that even look like? Because I think it would be helpful for us to actually be clear on what God calls sin. Because the music and the movies and even some of the popular pastors of today are confusing the church on what darkness actually is. So let's just go to the text. Galatians 5, verses 19, 19 to 21 says, now the works of the flesh, I love that word, are obvious. <laughs> <laughs> Sexual immorality, we know what that is. Moral impurity, promiscuity, idolatry. You know, I was talking to somebody backstage, I think it was Jamie, and saying how we really be thinking that we got to bow down to a statue to be an idol worshiper. When the Bible even says that covetousness, wanting something that belongs to somebody else is idolatry. How much do we do that on social media? That's interesting. Sorcery, witchcraft, tarot cards, astrology, mediums, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, Dissensions, factions, envy, feeling the type of way that they got what you don't got. Drunkenness, carousing. Carousing is a weird word. It means wild parties. And anything similar. I am warning you about these things as I warned you before, that those who practice, meaning continue in such things, will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's darkness. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10. I want you to understand one of the reasons I'm doing this for you is that the conscience, the parts of us that determine what is right or wrong, needs to be informed. So, so you have to have information to know what is right. You can't just know what is right within you. you. You have to learn what is right so you can respond to what is right, okay? 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10, it says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous, those in darkness, will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. I love that he's talking to the church and telling them, y'all going to think that certain things ain't sin when it is. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. If you practice, persist in, meditate on, find ways to do these sins, you are in darkness. But... But that is bad news that sets us up for good news. And the good news is that Christ doesn't want you to stay there. Jesus is the light of the world who died for those who are in darkness. 
Jesus died on the cross to handle and deal with the penalty of your sin, which is death. And here's what we forget. Jesus didn't also deal with the penalty of sin. Jesus also dealt with the power of sin. Have you ever wondered why it is so easy to do bad and so hard to do right? That is the testimony of every human being on planet Earth. And it is because sin is a power. Read Romans 6. It controls us like a master and we are its slave. I remember when I was 13, I, I read this book about somebody going to hell. Why I was reading that, I don't know. It just was intriguing to me. Like, what is hell like? Do they <laughs> have hell coffee? I don't know. And <laughs> it, it had, <laughs> can you imagine baristas in hell <laughs> that never get your order right? Like, that's... That's the darkness. <laughs> they keep re like pronouncing your name wrong. It's just like eternal irritation. That's crazy. Anyway, <laughs> I, read, I read the book, and at the end of the book, she had this sinner's prayer. I'm sure y'all have seen that if you grew up in some type of church context. And I said the sinner, sinner's prayer without faith, but I said it thinking that just by saying it, that would make me a Christian. And I went to school the next day, and I said, okay, I'm going to be holy, okay? I, I'm not going to curse nobody out. Like, I'm going to listen to all my teachers. Like, I'm going to be right. Maybe five minutes <laughs> into being at school. Somebody bumped into me in the hallway, and I just went clean off. And I was like, you know what? This ain't for me. I can't. I can't be righteous because you, you got me messed up. And so I have to, I got to handle you. I got to do something about this because it, I felt like holiness ain't for me, bro. Like it's just, it's too hard. And the problem was is that I thought I could be a Christian by just trying hard enough. I, I thought I could be a, a Christian by trying to make some kind of decision in my mind to live righteous. What I, what I didn't realize is that sin is a power that only... The supernatural power of God has to break off of me. It's like, it's like I was trying to, to run with chains on my feet. And, and I was not going to get far if somebody didn't come with a key and release me. That is salvation. Salvation is that Christ frees you from the penalty and the controlling power of sin. Now, once we are saved, Guess what happens? You are set free from sin's power, but also giving power over sin. Romans 6, 17 through 18 says this, but thank God that although you used to be, hello, slaves of sin, you obeyed from the heart that pattern of teaching to which you were handed over. And having been set free from sin, you become enslaved to righteousness. Why is that good news? It's good news because you are still in a body. You could be saved, but your body ain't. Your body has all kinds of sinful desires and passions. You are still in a world that is obsessed with darkness, which means that every single day of your life, you will be tempted with sin. You will still want to do it. You will still want to go places you ain't supposed to go. You will still want to say things you ain't supposed to say, like ain't. <laughs> but being tempted doesn't mean you aren't a Christian. The evidence is of, a, of being a Christian is how you consistently respond to your temptations. Having power over sin means that sin might bully you, but you can win. Because sin got a loud little mouth. Sin will talk crazy to you. Sin will make you feel like it has more power than the gospel. Sin will make you feel like it has more strength than the spirit. Sin will be real loud and bolsterous, but if, if the cross is real, if Jesus did defeat death by rising from the grave, and if that same spirit lives in you, it means that you have power. You, you have power to be righteous. You have power to live holy. 
You have power to live like Jesus. And through this power is where we get to the subject of sanctification. I said earlier that sanctification is the process of becoming like Jesus. Sanctification is a process because it takes time. It takes effort, and it even takes a strategy. You won't be sanctified by just sitting up and doing nothing. You can't just, just show up to church and think, okay, I'm going to be holy now because I sat in the pew and listened to the pastor and took communion. No, 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 ma'am. You know how many devils sit in churches and aren't changed? That means there has to be an inward regeneration. There has to be an inward change that then influences the way you move forward in life. You have to actually do something. Read your Bible and live it. Pray by the Spirit. Go to church and fellowship with the saints. Fast and consecrate and put sin to death. And, and don't think that just doing these disciplines is what sanctifies you. What sanctifies you is looking at Jesus in the disciplines. Does that make sense? You can read the Bible and still miss Jesus because you're reading the Bible wrong, right? So I want to offer you, I want to offer you the cheat code to sanctification. You ready for the cheat code? Everybody say cheat code. Cheat code. It's really simple. Look at Jesus more than you look at anything else. Look at Jesus more than you look at anything else. 1 John 3, 16, or 3, 6 says, no one who keeps on sinning, meaning they, they just out here, they just, darkness is the thing. Why? They haven't seen him. 2 Corinthians 3, 18, Paul says, we all with unveiled faces are looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord, and by looking at the Lord, we are then being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. Your growth in holiness hinges, is, is dependent on, is connected to who has your attention. Yeah, yeah. She knows. She's been looking for a minute. <laughs> I want to share a story from the scriptures that highlights this dance between seeing as a way of, like, seeing in the scriptures is usually another, like, a metaphor for faith. So by looking at Jesus, I don't mean going into your church's hallway and looking at the white Jesus on the wall that's not Jesus. That's not what I mean. <laughs> by, by looking at Jesus, I mean seeing what the scripture says about Jesus with the eyes of faith, okay? Now, this story in scripture that shows this dance is in John, th John 6. What happens is, is that Jesus takes two loaves and five fish and supernaturally feeds 5,000 plus people with it. The next day, people start looking for Jesus because he's just fed them these Olive Garden breadsticks from heaven and they want some more. <laughs> I would too, hello. And so when they find him, Jesus knows that they only came looking for him because he can give them some more Texas toast. Like they know... They're not coming for him. So Jesus tells them something about himself. He says, hey, you know what? Y'all looking for this natural bread, but I'm actually the bread of life. I'm the bread you need. The problem is when we read scriptures like that in the Bible, the way we engage with it is that we read Jesus saying, I am the bread of life, and we make an Instagram caption out of it, and we think that makes us holy. We think just talking about Jesus is the same as living like Jesus. But what Jesus said about himself is not some cute quote. It is a divine truth that you are commanded to believe. It is only believing God's word that changes you. Eve was changed and made a sinner by listening to Satan. And we are changed and made saints when we believe Jesus. Now, what happens? What happens when Jesus' words about himself are believed? How does believing Jesus Make us like Jesus. Have you ever been to Olive Garden? I mentioned it earlier. Raise your hand if you've been to Olive Garden. Look at y'all. They done made a lot of money off of y'all. Well, your parents, really, actually. Um, you know, they, they bring the little bowl of sticks out. 
Tony is fat, low-key. Like, she just be talking about food all the time. You got donuts during the sermon, Tony? During the sermon. You want some grape juice so we can make it holy? Huh? Okay. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, they, <laughs> they, they, bring, out the, they bring out the breadsticks, and what usually happens is you just kind of start to overindulge. You, you get one stick, and then you might get a stick and a half. And then they bring out the salad, and then they put a mountain worth of cheese on top. And so you just start to consume and consume and consume. And what can happen, depending on if you're Tony or not, is that when they bring out... When they bring out your entree, it's kind of like you don't even want it anymore. It's, is that, is that when you eat the bread, the bread fills you up so much that you can't even look at another plate of food. You're so, you're so satisfied by the bread that you don't have the same appetite you used to. So, so what happens is, metaphorically speaking, is that when, when Jesus is believed to be bread, it is that when you eat him, he fills you so much that when you see another meal or another opportunity for sin or another opportunity for pride or another opportunity for anger, you no longer confuse the temptation with a need. What, what Jesus is saying is, is I... And bread, so, so believe me, so you can be full, so, so secure in his love, so comforted by his spirit, so satisfied in the sun. And that is where holiness starts. It starts when you see Jesus. When you see Jesus, you don't want anything else because nothing else compares. I know some people want to scare you into holiness, but I want to persuade you. Look at Jesus. Look at Jesus. And when you look at Jesus, that is what changes you. Desiring God above all things is like soil. And from that soil is where holiness grows. We are already empowered by the Spirit to flee sin. But we will want and we will choose to put to death what is earthly in us when we believe that Jesus is better than everything we are tempted to leave him for. In closing, I'm over time. I'm sorry, Tiffany. <laughs> she said it like her name, Tiffany. Uh, I just, I just want to advocate for the scriptures. Not TikTok, but the scriptures. The scriptures is one of the primary places where you will see Jesus. The holy scriptures give us a constant, clear, sometimes confusing, but always true picture of God. This is why you do yourself a disservice anytime you open up your Bible looking for you instead of the God it's talking about. We also need to bring up the devil again and say that there is an enemy. Satan didn't disappear after Genesis 3. He may not show up in the body of a snake, but he shows up in the mouthpiece of a person on TikTok that tells you this Bible ain't true. The enemy knows that if you know more about God through his text, that you will have more reason to trust him. And if you have more reason to trust him, then the sin and the world will have less influence over you. So reading the Bible is an act of spiritual warfare. I, I don't, and I also, I don't want to put all the blame on the devil because every temptation you give into is one you actually wanted. So if the Bible is boring to you, I can, I can, I can be sensitive and empathetic of the Bible being boring because it's not as clear as we would like it to be. Just because you are young doesn't mean you cannot understand. God has given you a brain God has given you a mind. God has given you the ability to understand ideas and to communicate, but God has also given you the spirit who helps you interpret a text. Nobody interprets the Bible better because of their age. They interpret it because they leaned on Jesus as they read. 
If the Bible is boring, it, it could be that you are insecure about your ability to do the work of interpretation. But I encourage you to trust God. But it also could be that the Bible bores you just because God does. It's that you are more entertained and more happy with and you enjoy lesser things than the God who created the heavens and the earth. And so I just want to close with saying, Jesus said to the Pharisees once, you search the scriptures because in them you think that you have eternal life. But it is they that bear witness about me. The Bible is about God. And if the Bible is about God, that means it deserves so much of our time. I don't know where any of you are in this room as, as it relates to relationship with God. I don't know what stage of maturity you're in. I don't know what struggles you have. I don't know what temptations you are wrestling with. I don't know what fears you carry. I don't know what burdens are burdening you. I don't know what, what cares you haven't casted. But what I do know is that God loves you. And God didn't just say he loved you. He proved it by sending his son in the flesh to die for sin, releasing you from sin's authority over you so that you could look like God. How are you free? You are not free by simply acknowledging what I'm saying. You are free by responding to what God has said. And one of the ways to respond to what God has said is the act of repentance. Repentance means to turn from. It's a 180, not a 360, because if it's 360, you come right back to the same place. <laughs> to turn from sin. If this is sin, repentance is me refusing this. It is deciding and making a decision that this is not worth my time. This is not worth my energy. This is not worth my thoughts. This is not worth my ministry. This is not worth my heart. This is not worth my soul. I made a decision and a conclusion based on not what I feel, but what God has said, and I turn towards somebody. I turn towards Jesus, who is good, who is righteous, who is true, who is Lord, who is king, who is savior, who is good, who is eternal, and who is coming back for a church. And in the turning, Jesus sends you somebody. He sends you himself. He sends you a helper called the Holy Spirit who will help you. You cannot be righteous apart from faith. You cannot be righteous apart from leaning into and trusting in the Spirit of God to make you become something you were always meant to be, which is like God. So, I'm going to pray for us. Lord, we... We need you. I need you. Every day there are, there are so, there are so many seductions. There are so many things that entice our mind, that entice our eyes, that entice our bodies. Everything that the devil has to say sounds true. And so, so we need your help to discern what is good, what is right, what is worthy of our attention. So I ask for mercy in this place. I ask for compassion in this place that you would do the work of turning our hearts towards you in faith so that we would believe what you say is true. God, I pray that you would help us to have the endurance needed to trust you to the end. Narrow is the way to life and few will find it. But I pray, God, by your mercy that we would be the few, that we would not take the broad way, that we would not see death and delight in it, but that we would see you. I pray for grace, that you would give us the grace to live holy, righteous, true, and biblical lives. God, I pray for humility, for the humility to know that you know what you're talking about that you are right and true in all of your ways, God. I pray for integrity, that we would not be people who sing about you and hate you, that you would give, a, give us a heart of fear and of reverence, that we would see what John saw in Revelation where there's 
there are hundreds of thousands of angels surrounding your throne saying to him be glory, to him be honor, to him be praise, to him be worth. It doesn't seem like you deserve that, but you do. So help us see you in all of your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.